I really believe that if people put an effort, if they study, if they forget about distractions around them and commit themselves to, to this and this alone, they will be surprised how, how many good things come out of this. Those are kings. Those are kings. Today we've got a really cool guest on the line, Khan Mufti. Khan's responsible for getting me back into art. Watching one of the recent lessons that he did for the Pencil King site got me really inspired to start working again. The lesson of that everybody should learn is that things come out of nothing. Things evolve out of nothing. You know, the tiniest seed in the right situation turns into the most beautiful forest. Khan, welcome to the call. How are you doing today? Thanks for inviting me to this podcast. We are very accomplished artists. If you haven't seen Khan's work online, Google him, Khan Muftik, K-A-N-M-U-F-T-I-C. Really, really amazing stuff. So how did you get started? Thank you. I suppose um, drawing was always there, but it wasn't really my ambition ever. I was actually much more interested in in animals, in zoology. So I actually always wanted to become a zoologist when I was a kid. Uh, I spent a lot of time in nature with my dad mostly. We were just totally crazy. He loves animals as well. And he just kind of transferred that love for animals to me. But he's also an artist. And I think for him, as well as for me, (laughs) I was drawing because I was fascinated. Kind of like a caveman, if you (laughs) want. I would go out and see animals and just doodle and scribble. So that, that was that was kind of motivation. And when I found out after I finished my primary school, um, when you have to make a choice what you want to do in life, when I found out that there is a lot to learn if you want to become a zoologist, I kind of said, oh, well, I'm not really into learning, so I'm just going to take the easier way <laughs> and I got into art. <laughs> Uh, and how old were you when you made this like life-altering decision to sort of put zoology on the back burner and focus on on art? 13 or something, 12, 13, 14, so around that age, where I discovered going out and, and girls, and, and I didn't want to sit down and learn. And um, the art school that I was actually going to go to uh, was this proper old Eastern European uh, fine art school where you learn the craft you don't really learn you know physics and math and everything it's just like learning to do something with your hands it wasn't it wasn't any of that pretentious kind of contemporary modern art um attitude in that school it was it was a thing that you learn so is that the school that you ended up going to or take us through a little bit your education because i i imagine there's something uh, profound in in how you learn because again i'm just i'm so impressed when i look at your work i'm a huge fan really that means a lot to me and every time i hear a comment like that i actually i actually blush <laughs> i say <I'm> really <laughs> it really means a lot because i've put so much hard work into that and it started obviously when i went to that school And I didn't care about art at all. I was missing in many classes. I was was hardly there. They did a great job of not, they had this attitude, if you want to learn, it's going to be up to you, which was really great. So I did that for about a year, I believe. Halfway through, I I realized, oh, it, it is an absolutely wonderful thing. And I completely fell in love with art, mainly as a sculptor, then developed more into drawing. Yeah, about a year, maybe less. That's all happening in Bosnia, in Sarajevo. And unfortunately, early 90s, in 1992, uh, the war broke out. And sadly, um, I had to leave the country uh, with my family and I had to stop my education. So I spent a few years being a refugee, um, moving from one place to another. And at some point, I ended up in Switzerland. Um, They took us and they gave us sort of like an asylum and, and it took me many, many years to pick up art again. Um, you know, life was very intense during that time and just dealing with myself and all the things around me, what, 18, 19 year old. So mm-hmm. at some point I, I was sponsored to, to, to go to a private school, kind of like a modern art school, which had pretty much nothing to do with drawing and painting in traditional sense. It was one of these modern schools. But um, it, I had great time. Um, I was one of the few people who actually drew realistically, like figurative art. But I did have great time just, just you know, being inspired by people around me who, who did entirely different stuff. I mean, there was lots of 
lots of crap. So you can imagine rich Swiss spoiled kids just doing that because they don't want to do anything else. <laughs> but it was it was really nice getting inspired by other things other than just drawing. After that school, I kind of enrolled into uh, into web design, graphic design, s- stopped drawing completely for many years. Ended up in advertising, doing all sorts of stuff like motion graphics and VFX. I uh, started directing music videos. And at some point, while directing one of these music videos, everything was shot in green screen. So I had to come up with a background. I didn't know what to do. So I did some research and, and someone pointed to the so-called conceptart.org website. But I didn't even know there is, there is, there is an actual career in there, that there were jobs like that. And literally, when I saw that, I just lost it. I, I, complete, I was gobsmacked. <laughs> Within a week... I completely, entirely changed my attitude. Mind you, I was living really well. I was living in, a, in, in Zurich in a big flat, with lots of friends. I had a dog. I, everything was fine. A lot of my family is also there. So I had a great life. But um, I quit my job immediately. I had nothing in sight uh, and, and, and spent a year being unemployed and just practicing. And eventually I got a job in, in Brighton in, in UK. And I moved out from Switzerland to UK to Brighton, and then I worked in NCSoft Europe. And uh-huh. after a year, a year and a half, I moved to London. And I've been here in London for about six years almost now. Wow, that's a really intense story. Basically, you're sort of like at the top of the game. You're you're a young hotshot art director for music videos, and then you change everything in in the space of a week. Is that did I hear that correctly? Yeah, even less actually. I think it was three days when I wow quit or something. Yeah, I think uh, three days on the fourth day I told my bosses I'm off. And then did you have any plan? Like I, I'm guessing you had some money saved or your family helped you um, with no, this next year. No. Um, but you just kind of <laughs> I had nothing. I was I was going out a lot. I, I <laughs> uh, and I was spending a lot of money on just most stupid things like i don't know a car or just 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 stupid things basically clothes Mm -hmm. um but that all of a sudden that all just stopped nothing was important like i was hit by a by a by a lightning literally it's just okay what am i doing i'm not happy i need to i need to do this and i had absolutely nothing in sight and also in switzerland um it's a very rich country. It's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful country. And for some weird, inexplicable reason, there are no big game companies or big movie companies. So the only option for me was to become competitive for the game market, for the UK or European game market. And that is, as you can imagine, it's really hard. It's really hard. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Can you take us through a little bit of what that year looked like? Because it sounds like... In that year, you went from basically zero at being a concept artist to landing a job being a concept artist. So what what did you do? Just like lock yourself in a room with a tablet and a computer? Or um, did you apprentice under somebody? Or how, did, how did that work? Basically, I realized that for a career in, in, in games as a concept artist or in movies, I needed to relearn everything. Because I was taught in a very traditional way where you see something and you copy that something onto the canvas, right? Whereas, as you know, for, for concept art, you, you can paint, but everything is, is coming from your imagination and a lot of stuff needs basically constructing, pretty much the opposite of what I was taught. So not only did I have to start from zero, I had to kind of start from minus 20, where I had to rewire my brain completely. And yes, I did spend a year locked up in my room with, with my tablet, learning how to, to draw, to paint, um, to use actually Photoshop and Painter. And it was difficult. I never knew what's going to come out of this. Mind you, at that point, I was already 30. It's, it's, mm-hmm. not, it's not usual that you stop a career at 30 and then start from scratch. I mean, it's not like I was an old man, but I was at least 10 years older than most of these kids on forums. Hugely intimidating for me, and I just thought I'm I'm an old fart. I can't I can't keep up with all these smart kids who just seem so talented and everything. But then I realized that putting hours in in learning really pays off, 
And it, it, to this day, you know, it's it's the one thing, it's the only thing that helps. Prince of Kings. Prince of Kings. Tell me a little bit, like walk me through what your typical day looks like today as it pertains to the art that you're doing. Sure. Well, it starts with a healthy smoothie. My wife is a very healthy person and she brought me into this whole healthy food, healthy diet. Um, It really helps, helps focus, helps everything. So after I had my smoothie, quickly browse through my mails and literally I won't spend more than five minutes on it. And then I dive into work. I don't procrastinate. These days, I just dive into it, and I know that the first couple of hours, for me, are the most productive ones. That's like 80% of my day's work is probably done in the first couple of hours, if you see what I mean. And then afterwards, I like towards the evening, I'll either uh, go to a life drawing, which I go quite regularly, or I'll help my wife cook dinner, or I'll go to a gym. Um, or I'll just watch Simpsons and movies. <laughs> I definitely try and do the same thing myself, and I feel like if I have a good morning, um, then my afternoon is more like email, participating in communities, like yeah. doing kind of like basic research or whatever, things that don't require so much brain power. But from <laughs> these days, it's been like 7 a.m. till about noon, I'm on. And then after that, it's, I find that I kind of hit a wall. Are you working freelance now? Or are you uh, on a contract for people? I'm a freelancer. Yeah. So I, I'm guessing that you get paid by your piece. So if you can be very productive and get your work done in a few hours, then it, it doesn't really matter. It um, depends. So it's, 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 I actually prefer by day, but my clients get very used to, very quickly used to what I can do in a day. And as you say, these first few hours are essential. That's, that's where I get most work done. Mm, gotcha. You know, I've been working in, in offices. I've been employed for many, many years. This is I've only been freelancing for about a year, maybe less. It's inc- it's incredible how much time I wasted working in, in, you know, companies. I literally get to do in one day more than I would do in, say, three days in an office. It's the it's the biggest change I've noticed since I've started freelancing. It's I get I get so much more done. And I can also distribute my energy because not everyone's the same. You know, people, there are people, I know guys who work with me who need hours to kind of get into the things and and then then they start producing stuff. Well, I'm not like that, which is, you know, why I think that freelancing for me works really well. I, I manage my own time and I do it in a way that suits me the best. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Once I started to realize this, I, was, I would try to, you know, get into the office at 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. so that I could have a really productive morning and then try and convince my boss to let me off in the afternoon so I could, you know, kind of dick around at home. But mm-hmm. it never really worked out that way because there's a sort of, it always felt like in the office there's an expectation that you you come in and you put in your time and that's that's that. It didn't matter really how much you produced. If you produced twice as much as the guy beside you, it just <laughs> meant that that's what you did. You know, even in industries like video games, for example, which it's one of the youngest big industries and, and it's it's all these creative, cool people. And and it's still running into this nine to five model. And, and you know what? Even when they like request extra hours from people, which is what they always do, you know, the crunching, the famous, terrifying crunching hours. No one's more productive. It's it's a, it's a well-known fact. It's a trick by managers, by producers and whoever to kind of give this impression that people will be doing more work if you force them to stay in most companies. At least those I know, no one's paid over time. Uh, so you just force people to just hang around a bit longer. You make them frustrated. You take them away from their families and their partners and their friends or just their life without any real results. So, yeah, I'm very, I'm hugely frustrated about that. <laughs> mm. <you> notice. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the other realizations that you've had? Because I think it's quite interesting that you're quite new to this and you're really, like, fully embracing it and it sounds like you're really um, enjoying it. I am enjoying it. I mean, of course, there's, it's not like you, you do this nine to five thing and then you get the check at the end of the month. I can have five jobs at the time and then I can have no jobs for a while thank god it didn't happen so far but it's you know it's something that i know that is happening and that it will eventually happen and you know it's just it's just part of the business but it, it, it's very tempting to just 
become completely isolated in your little cave where you're working, particularly if you're working from home and not sharing a studio with other people. For me, for example, I make an effort to to go to gym, to go to live drawing sessions, to meet other artists. So I'm always, I'm always out. Every, almost every evening, I'm I'm going to meet someone. I'm going to do something. Um, that makes that keeps me fresh. It is that's the I think that's the biggest danger of of being a freelancer. Mm, I can definitely see that because I've I've been away from the corporate world or the regular nine to five for about three years, and I definitely feel that cocooning. And I've been looking for ways to to break that up personally. Mm-hmm. Um, my remedy is I usually go to a coffee shop, and but I'm still not interacting. You know, I go there, throw on my headphones. I see, I'm starting to see the same faces over and over again, but I don't know anyone's names. Yeah. Um, but I do like the idea of uh, incorporating artwork into this social aspect so that it's kind of, I feel that it, it can just be something that you do to enjoy that has the side benefit of impacting your career as well, but it's not the main focus. Doing those things outside work, distracting yourself and doing something entirely different will definitely feed back into your work. Artists always have been very social creatures in terms of society. And I mean, they were always weird people, <laughs> but they were very uh, conscious about, you know, their circles and, uh, you know, friends. And, and it, it was always important. And now just because we're so comfortable, we have all these software and all these tools that we can we can use and we can stay at home. We don't have to go out. It's a bit of a trap, I suppose. I'm going to go back to the freelance thing, and I know that there are a lot of people that are very talented and that would aspire to become freelancers. And um, so I'm going to ask the question for them that they're in the corporate job, they're very talented, but how do you make that transition? What does that look like, or how did you do it yourself? You have to be kind of a bit harsh on yourself, which means that you have to take certain risks. You have to... You have to sacrifice. I mean, you mentioned you you had to you had to spend a lot of time learning 3D and, and missing out on partying and, and and all all this stuff that was happening around you. But you know that's that that was your investment. And I think going freelance from from say being full full time employee is a very scary step. And I'm not going to lie to you. I I was very scared doing something like that when living in the heart of London. I mean that is. <laughs> it's a very stupid thing to do. <laughs> it is it is probably one of the most expensive cities to live in the world. Um, however, I, I do I do realize, and I did realize at the point that it's the only way for me. Well, it's not the only way, but it's it's probably the best way for me. Particularly in games, they've been they've been working on this one title for two years, three years, and then the new title is going to be the sequel of the previous title. So they're going to do the same thing for a few years. It drains you. It drains you at, at, at a certain point. It just takes all that inspiration, all that drive that you initially had that made you choose this career. And this is just my opinion. It's worth taking a risk. Asking yourself, is that what you want? Uh, or do you prefer having a bit of insecurity but working on different projects with different clients, meeting different people? Um, and it's, it's really a question that everyone needs to ask themselves and then make a decision whether that's worth or not. Because for me, for a long time, I didn't want to risk it. But now I'm actually really happy. I worked on, on so many different things just in the past year. I mean, I, I worked on four or five movies, like big movies, like a TV series, lots of commercials. I have worked on, on comic book illustrations. I worked on different video games, mobile and some AAA stuff, like crazy amount of projects in less than a year. So once you've made that decision uh, to get past your fear and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this, is it then like you put a website out with your portfolio and you start contacting freelance agents or do people know you already? Or what did that look like for you in terms of getting your name out and getting those first jobs? Or did you already have jobs coming in on the side? How did, how did that work? Well, it, I think it was a combination of everything, to be honest with you. So the, since I developed interest in concept art and illustration, I started posting my stuff, which I never really looked for employment. It just happened to me. I was so, so privileged. It just happened to me. People would find my work or I would just advertise my my work, my link, and, and I would get jobs. And it's, it happened for two major companies. Um, so I didn't really look for it. 
in that period of time where I was full time employee, I met so many people who, you know, when you work in a in a company, people come and go, you know, they leave. Once you tell the people that you know that you're off freelancing, they are aware of the fact that you're freelancing. They're aware that if something comes along, people will generally ask people they know, other than asking someone who might even be better than you, uh, but is someone they don't know. And I, I suppose that's the major part of it, just knowing people personally. Stuff like social networks. They, Facebook has become my <laughs> my business tool. But I think it's really a combination of all these things together. So what's coming up next for you? Like, Do you have any personal projects you're working on? Or where do you, where's uh, Khan going to be in like two or three years from now? I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, uh, I'm, I, I hope I'm going to continue working on movies and games. Um, I'm also starting, I just started doing like my own little animation project. Uh, I don't know nothing about animation, mind you. I have no idea about animation, uh, like a traditional hand-drawn animation. That's what I'm doing. And I did like already certain animation tests, like walk cycle, and so. And it's and it's really interesting, and it kind of works. Mind you, it looks horrible. It, it comes from from a very selfish motivation. You know, I just wanted to do something for myself and just please myself, make my own little project, and probably it's going to take me. A long time to do it, maybe months, maybe years, I don't know. But it's just something on the side that I can do whilst, you know, downtime or, or whatever. I'm, I'm fed up with just corporate stuff. I can do something that kind of pleases me. Um, and other than that, I, I'm putting great hopes in stuff that you guys are doing. You know, people like you, like Pencil Kings, like schools, people enthusiastic, you know, as, as yourself. Who, who are willing to, you know, put effort and help uh, aspiring artists make their way in this very difficult career because it is difficult and we shouldn't we shouldn't fool ourselves. It is very difficult, and and mm-hmm. that's that's another thing that I want to follow. You know, being involved, just helping other people. I think it's very important. You know, sharing sharing the knowledge. Um, one of the words that I picked up on when you were talking there was that word selfish. And you're saying that your animation project is something that you're doing for yourself and it's selfish. And selfish has such a negative connotation, but I think it's so important to make time and to like, carve out little blocks of time to do stuff for yourself. Like, you know, going to the gym is something that you do for yourself. Yes, it's something for your health. But uh, just to have a creative outlet that's not related to any project and maybe... You know, there's those projects I feel that they take your energy away. And definitely when you're in the office, I can feel that after a certain amount of time, like you were saying, you know, two or three years on a project, your energy and your enthusiasm for that generally starts to drop. Um, So it's nice to have these projects that I feel that can also give you energy, you know, that you get excited for them and that you sort of, you're kind of like on this path where you don't know where it's going to lead and bit by bit you're unlocking you know, a new talent or uh, just a discovery process and it's fun and, and exciting and allows yourself to be curious. So I think that it's good, definitely good to be selfish. Uh, I think that people should be more selfish with their hobbies and their, their creative pursuits. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's so easy to forget that. I'm going to be very open about it. Any job becomes a job after a while, whether you want it or not. It just it just becomes a job. And, and Mostly because there's so much pressure around these jobs. If, you, if you're working on, on, on big movie, for example, but uh, yeah. on the new upcoming Godzilla thing, I spent about two or three months working on it, like really developing the whole thing with the other guys. You know, the scale, the whole scope of a project like that, and, and there's a lot of pressure, and, and everyone's doing their very best to do whatever they can to make the product as good as they can, and, and, and it, it becomes very serious at some point, you know. It becomes a job. I'm not saying that Godzilla was a job. Quite the opposite, I think. Godzilla was one of the nicest things I've done in my life, to be honest with you. It was probably, yeah, probably one of the nicest things I've done in my life. Uh, but even that, you know, even that was 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 not just a walk in the park. You know, it was, it was, it was very, very difficult. Where can people find more from you online? Uh, where do you, how do people get in touch with you if they want to? Or um, how do we get more con? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you can get more con if you go. <laughs> now nah, I'm joking. Uh, you, I mean, the thing that I'm actually using regularly and frequently is Facebook. So if if you just type my name in 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 Facebook, you should come up. And I'm not uh, flooding my newsfeed with 
trivial updates because I absolutely hate that. Uh, but every now and then I post um, some stuff that I do or some thoughts or some, you know, walkthroughs of, of stuff I've done or I, I share interesting tutorials or stuff like that, you know. But I'm trying to keep Facebook as a useful tool and not just something that will suck me in and, and waste my time because that's, <laughs> that's what it's made for. Right. So it's just, if we look up your name, um, K A N M U F T I C, then we'll, we'll find you on Facebook. Yes. Yes. Cool. Well, um, thank you Khan, so much for, you know, hopping on the, the podcast here. I really, I learned a lot. And like I said before, you really, actually, I felt nervous to talk to you. I don't know why I don't usually feel nervous, <laughs> but I, at the beginning I did feel nervous because oh. you know, you'd help me out so much. So, um, yeah, thank you, and uh, I hope that the people listening they got some tidbits out of this, uh, things that they can take and use. And uh, we, you know, we've got lessons from Khan on the Pencil King's website, and uh, like he was saying, he's also posting lots of great stuff on Facebook. So, thank you so much. Uh, listen, Mitch, thank you so much for for having me, and also thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to share some of my experience in in these lessons um i really believe that if people put an effort if they study if they if they forget about distractions around them and commit themselves to, to this and this alone they'll be surprised how how many good things come out of this so yeah thanks thanks very much for having me and let's just stay in touch and let's create good stuff awesome thanks a lot Khan. okay take care all right bye That's it for this episode. We'd really love your support. So if you could hop on over to iTunes, hit that five-star review, and then leave us some kind words, we'd really appreciate it. If you're looking for more, you can find us at PencilKings.com or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash PencilKings. See you soon. Another amazing podcast magic production.